I'd like to welcome you uh, all back. I think um, we covered a lot of topics, um, surfaced a lot of problems, potential solutions yesterday. Um, and the focus of uh, this morning's session is recognizing reviewers. So we're going to have one in-person talk uh, followed by two online talks. If you would like to um, put some questions in Slido, that would be fine, but we won't actually take any questions uh, in this session. Uh, so without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Thomas Lemberger from EMBO. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, here we go. So, so thanks a lot for, for giving me the chance to, to talk today. First, I, I really want to say I have been enjoying the, the discussions yesterday tremendously. I, I think this is an amazing group, and, and we are really onto something important. I think, uh, you know, in spite of all, all our divergence and, and sort of subtleties, there is a core sort of consensus, and, and I hope that, you know, as an outcome of, of the meeting, we, we can sort of consolidate or, or communicate that to the rest of the community that this is really, really happening. So I, I find it really a super exciting moment. So today we are going to talk about uh, the issue of, of referee credit, <clears throat> and I'm going to report briefly of a, a workshop uh, that was sponsored by the Wellcome Trust that we held at, at EMBO in April this year. Uh, it was organized by Michel Garfinkel, head of uh, policy at EMBO, and uh, Bernd Poulvoir, who is head uh, of EMBO Press. They could not attend uh, the meeting, so I tried to do my poor best to report on, on that. Uh, and I, I hope I, I represent this, uh, this workshop, this work uh, uh, properly. So we invited a, a variety of representatives of different stakeholders across uh, publishers and, and journals, uh, funders, research institutions, and also service providers or, or technology platforms. And we, we uh, um, discussed the, the, this sort of fundamental issue of assigning academic credit uh, to re reviewers and, and referees. And the, the fundamental issue really is that peer review is widely recognized as an essentially essential uh, scientific activity, yet it is poorly or not acknowledged at all in, in research assessment. And so we took the, the scholarly system uh, from a holistic point of view, looking at all the interactions between funders, researchers, and, and publishers, to explore the inclusion uh, of um, uh, a peer review activity and, and maybe quality in research assessment and try to imagine processes uh, of how uh, referee data could be uh, transmitted. <clears throat> so peer review, uh, we talked a lot uh, about that uh, uh, yesterday, what is peer review, and we had uh, endless uh, work, uh, pre-discussions pre to, to the to the to the this workshop, and I think we all had different experience in peer review. Uh, this was my my reaction when I received the first peer review of my paper. I was almost crying, going to my boss and go, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And uh, it was actually not so bad, but it, it took me a while to to get used to that. And I think we all encountered sort of you know <laughs> different qualities and extent of of peer review reports. Uh, that, that might be, you know, more than we, we were asking for. And we talked a lot yesterday about uh, being adversarial, and we know that peer review can be sort of semi-adversarial from time to time. So just to specify the scope now of, of this workshop, we, we restricted that to what I would call classical peer review in publishing. And uh, for, for us, it was not a way to say that other forms of peer review were not important, in particular peer review of grants or, or applications to, to institutions are, of course, very important. But they are submitted to different constraints, different, different parameters, and so we wanted to have a clear framework for the discussions in, in this workshop. And in our mind, uh, peer review in, in scientific publishing has this sort of fear for uh, key features where independent expert or scientist, the peers, are going to do a critical analysis of a, of a piece of work. The review provide a detailed and not superficial analysis of, of the validity of the research. It's really the core of the operation. Help the authors to improve the study and make constructive suggestions, and then place the study in the broader context of the existing knowledge in, in a field, and, and their expert advice is, of course, very useful. So th this is what we had in mind. 
Now, in publishing, uh, we, we discussed a lot uh, yesterday the, 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 the emerging ecosystem of peer review of preprint, but the, the publishing system now, preprint or not, is sort of driven by independent entities, independent publishers, independent journals, independent platforms. It performs similar type of work to release public peer-reviewed research and do some, some work that costs energy. And, and they, they perform that in a, per, a totally independent way. So in effect, they compete for authors and manuscript, which is not obligatorily a bad thing. A competition can be good. But they also compete for a pool of reviewers, which is of limited size. And this leads to, to the exhaustion of, of the peer review um, pool, which leads to a phenomenon of this bottleneck of, of peer reviewers. And, and we experience that in a, in a sort of very painful way. Uh, at journals, we have sort of quantified this uh, at Embo Press, you see here six uh, different journals. Actually, one is not a journal, but a peer review platform. Um, and, and you see, uh, we plotted here the number of people that we have to invite actively um, to secure, on average, 2.85 review, reviewers per, per paper. So all these journals achieve the same uh, number of, of reviewers, average number of reviewers per paper, but the effort uh, in, in terms of inviting the number of, re, uh, of reviewers is, is quite different and it is really uh, sometimes really dramatic. So on average, more than 10 people needs to be contacted to secure this number of re reviewers. And you can see the extremes up to 40 or 50 in some cases. This depends on the level of selectivity of the journal. Of course, if you are very, very harsh at the initial selection, it's much easier to convince reviewers to, to review exciting papers. But it also really depends on the fields. And, and there are fields that are notoriously difficult to, 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 to review. And, and we know that at the journals, when we receive some papers in some fields, oh my God, you know, this is going to be really difficult, in spite of the fact that a study can be really, really exciting. So th there is an issue that we, we have to, to address. So one of the first uh, exercises we, we did in this workshop was to be explicit about the, the scenarios and the user stories that we could imagine as potential use of, of an academic uh, uh, referee credit. So who are the users across the stakeholders and how would they use a hypothetical referee credit and, and for what reason? And I think one of the first user stories was as a, a reviewer and in particular as an early career researcher, I want to communicate my reviewer profile activity to institutions such that it benefits my, my career and job security. So I think this is kind of fundament, fundamental. As a researcher, I would like to document my reviewing activity to my institution so, so, such that it can be used in my evaluation, in appraisals, um, maybe trading uh, reviewing points a, against teaching points, maybe having some more time to finally get, uh, get tenure or, or things like this. As a journal, of course, uh, or as a funder, I want to access scientists a reviewing profile as as work example to be able to select and, and recruit uh, additional reviewers um, and expand this this pool of reviewers uh, to people that I do not necessarily already have in in my network and, and as an institution I want to access an applicant's reviewing profile so that I can use it as an indicator or as a proxy of constructive and accountable contribution to the, the scientific community so this can, could be a criterion that could influence um, uh, hiring uh, decisions. And as an institution, I want to access an applicant's reviewing profile so that I can use it uh, as an indicator of scientific excellence. Now, no, these are potential use cases. And of course, there's a lot of discussion on which one are realistic, which one uh, can be implemented, and, and, and others might be more controversial. So <clears throat> we do not have too, too much time, but to, to summarize a little bit the, the, the key outcome of, of this workshop, uh, we had a, a several points where there was global agreement across the group and, and some points that were clearly more controversial. There was unanimity to, to say that peer review is an essential scientific activity. Um, but it was a little bit sobering for us to see also a, a fairly clear message, at least from this group, which was small, um, that re referee activity will not be a, a primary assess uh, assessment criterion for for higher and, and grant awards. Maybe some accessory or complementary, but not a primary. Um, now, credit was seen as being particularly relevant for early career research uh, scientists, maybe less so 
uh, for senior uh, uh, level and tenure and established scientists. But, but clearly, the, uh, the ECR community are those that, that, benefits the, that would benefit the most from a, a credit a system and also those that we uh, should try to embed and, and involve as early as possible in, in, in the system. Now, there was a lot of talk about assessing the quality of the reviewers or the quality of individual reviews, and there was a lot of, I think, nervosity about that. Uh, assessing the quality of reviews or reviewers is, is really challenging, and one has to be very careful. There is a, an obvious need to increase the size and the diversity of, uh, of the reviewer pool. Uh, we talked yesterday about, about uh, a very wide uh, a field, and I think this is a, um, an important uh, issue. And, and then um, the, the need, the absolute need of having much better training for, for peer reviewers uh, to, to have the, the youngest generation being, uh, being submitted to some form of even formal training for, for this very important activity. If peer review is essential for science, then it should really be part of, of training. And as such, um, there, there, must, there might be also a need to have a credit system actually for the trainers themselves to, to really uh, accelerate that. So there was only partial agreement on, on sort of the, the use case or the, the, how, how the, the credit would really be actionable. And I think this is the, the, the key thing now, the key next step is to experiment to see if anything can be really done uh, in reality. Institutions could use referee activity in appraisals and promotion, and this seems to be a sort of a low-hanging fruit. There was no perfect agreement that it would be really useful, but I think this has to be tested uh, empirically. Funders could use referee activity or, or quality to assess the quality as a researcher. This is a bit more controversial, but of course, it could be a stronger credit form. Um, if, if somebody does a really good job as a peer review, shows really insight and good communication, it should be rewarded. And, and it, there was also a lot of discussion of what kind of information should be uh, exchanged. Uh, should we communicate raw reviews to, to funders? Nobody would have the time to, to read them. Or should we um, have a, a system that exchange certificates uh, uh, provided by the journals and the publishers? So the open issues are really linked to this assessment of the quality of the, of the reviews. This is very difficult. Uh, journals typically measure and rank the, the reviewers according to several dimensions. We, we check you know, the, the depth and the, the, of the coverage of a review, uh, whether a review is informative and critical, whether it's constructive and, 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 and provides suggestions for improvement, and also the tone and the manner of the review, if it's on, on a collegial tone and professional tone, or whether it is on the adversarial uh, uh, style. Now, there are also potential unintended consequences of a credit or to assess too much the, the review quality it may reinforce some biases, the pre-existing biases, and decrease even further the, the, the willingness to review if people feel that every word they're going to, to write in the referee report is going to count for, for future assessment that, that could backfire. Now, who should do the, 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 the measure of the quality of the review is also very open. Uh, it can be done by humans, by the authors themselves, but this, this has uh, many, many issues as well, as long as the, the process works as it works today. And, and we talked yesterday a lot about creating a different culture. Uh, editorial scores exist. They could be transmitted, but it is also a bit controversial. Now, we could also use machines. And of course, now we are at the age where where GPT is uh, synthesizing entire assays and, and police reports and, and, and uh, the, even invent uh, scientific articles that do not exist. So there is a, a large potential for, for uh, language models to extract features uh, from reviews uh, and, and referee report to measure information density, to check at conce conceptual content and alignment with, with the paper, maybe do, to do a classification of types of statements, how many experiments have been really uh, suggested, maybe uh, also uh, um, a, a check uh, similar to sentiment analysis to, to, to verify the style and the tone. Now, this is, of course, also controversial, and one has to go very carefully. Um, and there is a, a lot of skepticism whether this can be a productive approach. Uh, and I just want to show an experiment we did with, with the team to also raise awareness uh, about the, the human side of, of evaluation. 
uh, and, and be really aware that the human evaluation of the quality or the tone of a report can be extremely variable. So we asked 15 different editors to, to uh, score snippets of reviews for their degree of offensiveness so on a scale from one to five, one which is neutral and five is maximally offensive. And, and you see A, B, C, D, uh, the, the columns are the different editors, 15 editors. Red is very offensive and blue is, is uh, inoffensive. And you see the, the rows are individual reviews. And of course, the, at the extreme, the reviews that are the most offensive are recognized by most of the editors and the reviews that are quite neutral are recognized also by most of the editors. But then in between, there's a huge variability. And, and on the left, you have what we call the sensitive bunnies, the, the editors who find almost any review almost offensive because they are not so, so gentle. And then on the right, you have the, the crocodile, crocodile skin who essentially cannot be moved by anything. And you know, every, every kind of offense and, and turn of, of wording is actually fine. And I think it's really important to, to, to make this exercise and sort of compare to each other and to measure this variability um, and to be aware. So collectively, I think humans are, are excellent classifiers, but, but individually, uh, they can be very variable due to unknown reasons. And that could be, in combination with machines, uh, could be an advantage because, of course, machines will also have biases, but they tend to be less affected by the previous nights or the, the quality of the meal that you just had. So I just wanted to, to finish with now what would be the next steps uh, after these workshops. For, uh, for us, it's really to engage with specific funders and institutions to try now to, to talk concretely, to do something about it, not only talk about it, but really do something. What, what um, information would be important to HHMI, to, uh, to, to uh, Wellcome Trust, to other funders, to know to have an influence uh, on, on their decision and make this academic uh, credit for reviewers uh, real. So please, if you are interested in participating to this kind of pilots, um, it involves also reporting back what has been useful or, or not. We, we would be really excited to, to engage. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, now we're going uh, online uh, to hear from Richard Sever at uh, Cold Spring Harbour. Richard, are you there? Um, I am. Can you can you see and hear me, Fiona? Oh yes, I can. It's a bit like a séance. Um, <laughs> so that's like so many of our conversations, Fiona. Exactly. <laughs> so the good news is I'm going to advance the slides for you. How does that sound? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, over to you. And just say next slide, please. Okay, so, right. Um, well, thanks very much for the invitation, Jessica and, and Fiona. And I'm, I'm only sorry that I'm, I can't be there in person and instead of floating in a cell cortex. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to move pretty fast. This is just a quick proposal. Um, in many respects, Jamie Fraser set me up for this. And I'm, I'm hoping um, that, that, that Prachi Avasti is going to knock it out of the park by saying I've already done all this. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this is a, um, okay, we seem to have missed one, but never mind. Um, uh, this is a slide that we show the students at Cold Spring Harbor every year um, when we talk about um, careers in academia. And obviously, the you know the ideal is that you know at some point in your twenties you get your BSc, do a PhD, follow it by a postdoc, you get a tenure track position, um, get tenure in your sort of thirties or forties, um, and you know later on in your career you're elected to the National Academy and ultimately win the Nobel Prize. Um, so next slide. So, you know, of course, this is a, a fiction. Um, hardly anybody gets uh, elected to the National Academy and almost no one wins a Nobel Prize. Uh, next slide. But it's actually much more of a fiction than that, because the reality is that the vast majority of people don't um, progress beyond a postdoc in the academic career timeline. Um, and it's arguable whether or not um, postdoc um, should be the start, the, the end point in, in, in this particular slide or, or PhD. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and the reason for this is that people go on to other careers. So this sort of complicated red scheme on the left is data from the uh, Royal Society showing career paths for PhD students in the UK. 
And what you'll see is that there's a, a, a multitude of places where you take different turns into careers outside science, industry, government, etc. But the key point is that in relation to that timeline that I showed earlier, only 3.5% end up with a permanent academic position. There's some debate about that number. Some people have said it's not 3.5%, it's 6.5%. Um, you know, to me, it makes little difference whether it's one in 33 or one in 16. Um, the, 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 the clear result is that more than 90% of people are not going all the way along that timeline, and we shouldn't expect that they will. Um, for if you want data from the United States, a useful number is the R0 for biomedical academics of 13.6. Now, what this is, is that um, biomedical PIs in their lifetime will train 13.6 PhD students on average. Now, when they die or retire, whichever comes first, um, that will create space given a constant number of uh, faculty positions for one of their students. The other 12.6 will have to go and do other careers. Uh, next, next slide, please. And you know there are lots of um, different different things that they can do. Important people have written books about this. Um, my my experience is obviously in science writing and science publishing, but there are a variety of variety of career options that they need to to know about. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one thing that is often a, a shock to them is to find out these alternative careers are extremely competitive. Um, you know, in, when, when we advertise jobs, you often get hundreds of applications for them. And so it's really critical that these individuals have evidence of interest in the job that they're applying for. And, if, and ideally, evidence that they have some ability to do it. Uh, next slide, please. But actually... Our PhD programs and postdoc programs don't really do this. Um, you emerge from a PhD with a PhD thesis, which no one is going to read. Um, you may have made some posters. They're ephemeral. People won't have seen them. And you may have a couple of papers on a very narrow, arcane subject. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what the, you know, the, the PhD, the bottom of the PhD student CV will look like. It will probably have um, a first author paper with their supervisor and somebody else. If they're lucky, they may be a co-author on another paper. This is, it would be fairly typical. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for the fortunate few, there are internships. I know there are some graduate student programs that are, are building this into graduate programs so they can go and do internships in industry or other areas. Um, but that's a minority. Uh, the very lucky lucky few may get op opportunities in journalism. I've certainly employed people in the past who had been able to write things in magazines um, and newspapers, which sort of demonstrated that they were potentially good science writers. And a small number of people may have um, the opportunity to write a review article if their supervisor is asked um, to write a, a review article and says, hey, I can't do it, but the student in my lab will do it. Um, then that's great. But again, that's um, relatively few people. Next slide, please. Um, so what I want to propose is that we um, consider preprint reviews as potential evidence for, the, for these people. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for suggesting this. One, if you're writing um, a preprint review, it's a real opportunity to demonstrate your writing skills in something that somebody can actually read. It's an opportunity to demonstrate critical ability to analyze somebody else's work rather than simply present your own. And it's an opportunity to demonstrate a breadth of understanding that's much more diverse than just the very, very narrow field in which you've written a paper yourself or in which you've written a PhD thesis. And critically, there's a very, very low barrier to entry to this. Anybody can, can, can do this. You don't necessarily have to be invited. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, in an ideal world, then um, the, 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 the PhD um, of, the, of the future CV begins to look like this. They have those two papers I mentioned before, but that's augmented with a series of other career outputs. They could have a number of um, reviews of other people's papers, um, and then they could have... Um, Ideally, you know, things that look a bit more like review articles on a site like uh, Prelights. Um, next slide, please. Um, so my proposal is that we formalize preprint review as a part of PhD and postdoc training. We publish these reviews and assign them DOIs so they're permanent identifiers so people can find them, they can list them on CVs. And in doing so, we create a new set of outputs that demonstrate skills relevant for other careers. 
Um, and it was pointed out to me when I discussed this with the dean of Cospring Harbour Graduate School that this is a career currency that would be a value to employers outside ac academia, but it would also be a value to potential employers in inside academia because it would be a demonstration of additional um, critical skills. Next slide, please. Um, and, and this would be very easy to do. I mean, the great thing is that we have all the tools to do this already. Journal clubs are common. We routinely run these in, in graduate schools and lots of labs do them. And lots of those labs are doing them for preprints. We have preprint commenting on sites like BioArchive and MedArchive. We have pre-lights and pre-review, which have gone almost all the way to that formalization that I suggest. Next slide, please. And we have ORCID. This is my ORCID record in which I got a notification for verification of a peer review I did for PLOS recently. Um, this could easily be done for the kinds of preprint reviews I'm proposing through sites like pre-review and pre-lights. And I suspect that Sam and Daniel will tell me that this has already been done. So that's an, another reason to go forward. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so then, you know, the, 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 this CD of, CV of the future looks even better because not only do you have a list of all these preprint reviews and preprint news and views, but they're all you know, to some extent verified as being by this person, they are attached to um, their permanent ORCID record. So that's really the proposal, which I think will be very easy to do. I mean, one thing I really want to emphasize is that I think this has to come from the top. Um, as I mentioned, I did discuss this idea with um, the Dean of our graduate school. He was very enthusiastic about it and felt that it was something that we could easily implement. But I also um, discussed it with a young um, early career researcher. And, and she made the point that if you look at that CV, those first two things at the top will benefit the student and they will benefit the supervisor. All the things below benefit only the student, not the supervisor. So I think it's important um, that this comes top down, this comes from the institutional leadership, because I don't think we can necessarily um, count on all PIs to get on board. Thanks very much, that's all. Thank you very much, Richard, really interesting. Um, and now I'll come on to our third speaker, uh, Prachi Avasti uh, from Arcadia. Oh, hi, Prachi. Hi, how are you? Can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Just say next slide when you want me to advance them. Great, thank you. So first, I just want to give my full-throated support of uh, Richard's proposal. I think it's a fantastic idea. I agree with everything you said, except for the fact that it has to come from top down. I think uh, everyone should go home and post a review, uh, get a DOI and put it on their CV. I think it's a great idea. Um, okay, so uh, thank you all and the organizers for giving me an opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our efforts um, at Arcadia Science to promote and recognize preprint review. But um, first, I'm going to tell you about what Arcadia Science is so you understand where we sit in the scientific ecosystem. Next slide, please. Uh, so for about the last year and a half, um, we have launched this organization. Um, and the explicit purpose of Arcadia Science is to really experiment or more accurately run pilots on how we do science. So what science we do, how it's supported financially, and how it's communicated. And that, um, so that what science we do is sort of letting evolution solve biological problems in an organism agnostic way, expanding the range of organisms we use. Um, and we are we are a for-profit research and development company, really looking for sustainable and replicable models uh, to sort of engineer serendipity and, you know, maximize, uh, you know, scientific discovery and innovation, um, you know, and really from all the way from fundamental basic science to commercial commercialization. And then, of course, you know, I think open science is better science, uh, faster, more rigorous. It's the only way I can think of if we actually wanted to try and, do, uh, you know, meet all of our goals. It's the only way to sort of pursue things. Um, and we are doing this sort of experiment intentionally untethered from the system, okay? And what I would like to urge you all is to not just write us off because we sit outside. Um, the, the idea for doing that is so that we can run bolder experiments that seem too risky to do in another context. Um, and to really let what we're doing try to inform the way you think about what you're doing. And hopefully we're doing things that are useful to you that you might be able to, um, you know, use pieces of it, iterate upon it, um, you know, uh, find, uh, have, have it sort of uh, inform more experiments, more pilots in, in the sort of uh, how we do science. Next slide, please. 
And so the piece, the last piece of that was how we communicate science. So we are intentionally trying to share the science that is going on at Arcadia in a little bit of a different way. We're trying to um, share not uh, so the first uh, point here is that we're not using traditional journal publication. That does not mean we are not publishing. We're doing it more early, more often um, in uh, sort of we want to put uh, the science out there in the most useful way that we know how. Uh, so putting data in data repositories, protocols and protocol repositories, um, you know, using a wide range of modular products, anything from ideas to, um, you know, single experiments to data sets, uh, anything you can think of, um, and really, uh, you know, having it be citable and discoverable. So we're going to have DOIs and it's indexed in Google Scholar. Um, and, and essentially from many of the experiments that we have heard from a lot of the things that are going on from the people in this room and, and virtually uh, attending this conference, uh, we are very much fans of public feedback for uh, it's better for authors, reviewers, readers. I think uh, it's a very, very essential that we have this conversation about science out in the public. Um, and next slide, please. Um, so if you wanted to hear more about how we're actually sharing science at Arcadia, you can go to so our website, arcadiascience.com. If you click research, it comes to all of our pubs. Um, so a uh, huge shout out. I don't know if Gabe Stein's still in the audience. Uh, we're using PubPub as our platform. Uh, so we've been working with Knowledge Features Group to actually uh, set this up for us. Um, and we were really adamant not wanting to build something for, from scratch because we started doing science right away and wanted to share it yesterday. So <laughs> we want to make sure that that gets out there. But you can read... Um, our pub here on, on the publishing experiment right on the website. Next slide, please. Great. Um, and so this is just a, a zoom in of that pub, but what you can see on the right are a bunch of comments that have been put forth from um, just from uh, people in the public. Um, and so really where people are directly able to annotate and um, highlight what, um, how they would respond to our comments. Okay, so the, the real question, um, next slide, please is why would anybody for the science that we put out into the world, why should anybody in the in the universe, any scientist give their time to give public feedback to a company on their science, right? So I knew everybody would ask me this and say, oh, you know, what, what should, why, should, why should we do this for you? Why should we help? So of course, in addition to us having this sort of mission to ensure that we are trying to do the kind of science that will change uh, you know, science for everybody else. You know, we very much don't want to be a building that just does something interesting. There are a lot of buildings that do interesting science. Uh, we really want to change, have what happens in-house dr dramatically impact what happens out of house. So um, the goal is to, of course, do this type of impactful science that might set up, send other scientists many decades forward in the future for their own work. But Again, we want to be good sort of stewards in the scientific community. And if we expect people to give us feedback on our public products, then we are going to want to give feedback to other scientists on their on their research. Um, and so uh, next slide, please. So what we wanted to do was, of course, I think one of the best things that we can do is, is give people feedback on their preprints. We've been talking for the last day about how we can... Uh, provide uh, public feedback. We know that there needs to be more of this and um, the amount of the public feedback on, on preprints is still quite low, even though there's a lot of um, under the hood um, exchange going on point to point. Um, and so what we did was set up a hypothesis group. You can see we've got a group there, Arcadia Science, um, and we've already had a couple, uh, almost a couple of hundred um, annotation on, on preprints. So that means our scientists are able to directly annotate. They can assign that to um, Arcadia um, the Arcadia Science Group, and then it will show up in the in bioarchive and in, in sort of the community reviews. Um, and um, you can see on the right there that we've got our scientists listed, and it's got a count of the sort of annotations and comments that they've made on preprints. Um, and we have told them that this is sort of explicitly expected, that part of their job is, you know, everybody is, read, we're scientists, we're doing science, we are reading preprints all the time. And in fact, you know, in, in, in fact, we're like, um, I think more of science is doing, they're reading more preprints than, um, you know, earlier, more people are doing this, and you, you want to be on the cutting edge of science. And so we're reading preprints all the time anyway. And of course, as scientists, we have opinions on them. Um, and so, uh, we've explicitly told our scientists that we expect them to, you know, when they're reading preprints and commenting on them to to post it publicly and, and do it in this way uh, under our Arcadia Science Group so that they can actually, um, you know, have it counted. And we said that this is this is an expectation. Um, uh, and we've been given them, a, a, you know, a number, you know, a couple of preprints a month that we expect them to do this. Um, and then uh, next slide, please. 
And we're having that all collected. We've worked with a, a society team at eLife to sort of have this, have Arcadia Science be sort of a reviewing group so we can get them all in one place. And, and for us, I can sort of track, you know, um, what we're doing and making sure that we're continuing to do this. And we can point to the community when they say, what are you, you know, why should we, why should we comment publicly on your work? And we can say, look, we, we're also doing this and, and point them to a page on society that um, shows the evidence of that. Um, but of course, when you ask your scientists to do something, uh, you have to make sure that you provide them the time and space to do it. So next slide, please. And I can't think of a better way than to provide free pizza. Um, I think there is no <laughs> there's no time in your career or any sector where free pizza is not appreciated. So once a month, we have a preprint review party where we collect all the um, scientists, we have free food, and we sort of uh, sit in a room and uh, talk about science, people annotate um, and comment on preprints. Um, and we do that once a month. But it, we, when the first time we did this, we were so excited. Everyone was so uh, completely thrilled. It was really felt like we were doing something good. Uh, and we felt like we had to share, uh, next slide, uh, that we decided to uh, send money to 20 different groups so that they could have their own preprint commenting party. Um, and so we did this. It ended up being 21. Um, uh, next slide, please. And we asked them to share with us what they were doing. And so you could see all the comments we got back. These are all the people who held preprint commenting parties, sort of, in, uh, you know, sponsored by uh, the pizza we, <laughs> the pizza money we sent them. Um, and really, you know, you can see overwhelming different, uh, you know, people commenting. Uh, they commented on four preprints. They got students and postdocs together. They had, um, you know, some uh, folks said that this was the uh, sort of most effective journal club they've ever had. And on doing this in the future, it was really, really positive. Next slide, please. Um, and again, of course, so I, some of you may know, ASAP Bio has a published or reviews initiative. We've also asked our scientists, if you get asked to review, uh, to um, make sure that the review is, uh, that the paper that they've been asked to review is, is posted as a preprint and then um, and then post their comments publicly. And so uh, we're asking our scientists that get us reviewed to do that. Um, and we're strong supporters of this initiative. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so this is the second to last slide, so don't check out yet. So I just want to summarize quickly that um, what we're doing is we want to sell, set a culture of community contribution and public feedback. Um, the expectations are really clear up front. We've told our scientists we expect them to do this. Um, and, and again, if you ask people to do something, you have to provide a way and time to do that um, and uh, so that they uh, have, a, you know, so that they don't feel sort of conflicted in what they spend their time on. Um, and so, um, and we want to have mechanisms that they can do that, um, that can be visible and tracked. So we have our hypothesis group or um, collected in society, and then that gets posted to BioArchive. Um, and then, uh, right, so we have these uh, sort of, like I said, uh, preprint pre commenting parties to, so that they have time to do it. And then uh, we have said it's part of the expectation that they do this um, as scientists at Arcadia. Um, so we're, they're evaluated in part on that public contributions. Now, I personally don't like to be told what to do. So I always assume that no one wants to have sort of a hard number to hit. And then they just try to hit that no matter what um, and do that and only that. Um, but it does help I've, in our experience doing this so far. The scientists just say, like, just tell me how many, many, many of these you want us to do and we'll do it. <laughs> so we sort of gave them a number, like try to do a couple of these a month. Um, and then, of course, like, uh, you know, I will say that the impetus of this is not to sort of you know, just have this as a way of evaluation. I will tell you that we have infinitely better ways to evaluate our scientists that are much more, um, you know, granular than, than you know, having them align and just try to hit some sort of uh, number. Um, but we want to make sure that we're providing that time and that we're aligned and that they understand that it does matter and that we want to be good stewards in the community. Um, and so we want to really spark this, not just within house, but outside of house. So we want to encourage the outside world to contribute. So we've done that through one sponsored activity, but we want to, you know, we've got this hashtag preprint comment club and people are every month when we do this, in fact, we were supposed to do it today, but a lot of people are out of town for conferences. So um, we're going to postpone it a week and do our, our, our pizza party next week. Um, but then every time we do this, we, we post a ton of uh, preprint reviews and comments, and then um, we ask the rest of the world to do the same. Uh, next slide, please. And for the last slide, I will tell you what we are intentionally not doing in this, which is that we are not evaluating our scientists on whether or not their pubs got comments and what those comments are. So it's not on the actual 
pro their scientific product that has comments in the way that we talk about referee preprints. Because for, of course, in some sense, not, not all of those comments will be useful or necessarily aligned with our priorities. We may not want to address any like any and all comments that come in. We will just use it in the way we use our judgment to decide how we want to improve our scientific products. Um, and and you know, again, I try made tried to make this point yesterday. The the com the comments and peer reviews are always still a single point in time evaluation at the beginning of a lifetime of people of, of work. There is so much more withstanding the test of time that orthogonal testing that is really a measure of the rigor and quality of work. And you know, it's the ability to evaluate that work that we think is so important. So at that single point in time when we share the work, we want to have reproducible workflows. We want to have data available where people can actually mine it and reuse it so we can judge the quality of our work. Um, and so that is something that we're aiming for. Of course, we care about, you know, if there are comments, we want them to be public. And we actually ask everyone who comments on our work that we don't want private communications. You won't find like the easy path to, to privately email us about this. We want the comments to be public. And we don't want to sort of incentivize delayed posting of our science. You know, we don't want people to agonize over what might people say publicly and then have that drive fear into having them delay when they post their work. The work is more useful out into the world than under the hood. And it can only really be done and get better once we share it. And so uh, we want we don't want them to fear that public commenting and just get it out sooner and, and really have that public conversation. Um, and we just ultimately, you know, like I said, this we are telling them that this is part of their job and we want them to contribute to public uh, reviews so that we can also, in good conscience, request that from the audience um, and from the from the scientific community. But we are not letting that difficulty in evaluating scientists like drive the decision making in how we do science in-house. Um, we're really after trying to do this in uh, sort of the best way, you know, we know how, acting in service of the science and trying to sort of align everything as well as we can along the way. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, Great. Feel free thank to you, <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, I'd like to thank our three speakers so far for really stimulating presentations. Um, and now we're going to move into the bro breakout sessions like we did yesterday. But before that, <laughs> um, I wanted to um, give you a summary of yesterday's poll, which we conducted. Um, and I just wanted to... Uh, highlight on the right-hand side of the slide the um, modifications which were suggested uh, to um, the proposal. And the main one was an anxiety about protecting the reviewer's anonymity. You'll remember that several um, solutions to that were um, proposed. So we are going to have uh, another poll um, after uh, the uh, breakout sessions uh, and I just wanted to prime you to that. So this time, uh, if you can go on Slido, you can scan the uh, the QR code. Um, we um, want you to um, answer the questions which are listed here, which is about um, what we view about um, preprints with reviews. So again, a poll, and also we need uh, some comments. We've got... Um, more questions. Are we voting now? We're voting now. Oh, God, sorry. Yeah. 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 So okay, go, go right. Go for it again. Right. Go for it again. Okay. Yeah, you need to okay. keep it on the slide. The actual take it. Yes, take a deep breath. <laughs> that was yesterday. This is today. today. So please vote and we can monitor the um, comments uh, as, they, as they come in in real time. I think I just jinxed this. No, it's <laughs> ah, excellent. It's amazing. Interesting. Discussing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you could 
spoil your ba ballot. <laughs> Okay, we still get the numbers are still climbing. This is very good. Okay, any last polling? Oh, sixty four. Okay, anyone else? <coughs> okay, if not, do I move on to the next question. Thank you very much. So um, we're getting um, strong consensus on um, actually all um, four of the questions. Right, uh, so the next one is um, rec a recognition for reviewers. So please um, vote your preferences again. Fifty-eight, don't give up. Any more before we close the poll? Okay, I think a few people have break, broken off early for a cup of coffee, so um, <laughs> thank you very much for that. Um, is there another question? No, we're just going to Okay. So, so uh, the poll is officially closed and we'll dig into that uh, more later on in the session. So um, now we are going to go into the breakouts. Um, and of course, you can see your name and group number and location. Um, and we will re we'll have a break at 10.45 uh, and then we'll reconvene for uh, reporting um, and further discussion at 11.05. Um, so thank you very much for participating and I'm excited to hear what comes out of the next session. Thank you. <laughs>